Good afternoon and welcome to our formal debate. Today we will be debating the pros and cons regarding the use of punishment in the field of applied behavior analysis. Our affirmative team members include Caitlin, Rachel, and myself, James Johnson. While our con team members are Lauren, Kayla, and Elizabeth. Regardless of your position on the use of punishment in applied behavior analysis, we hope you all walk away with a better understanding of its use and how it can and does influence various aspects, both positively and negatively, regarding treatment and its use among individuals themselves. Thank you. Our objective is, should punishment be used within the field of applied behavior analysis? To begin with, what is punishment? Punishment can be defined by Cooper, Heron, and Heward as an occurrence when a stimulus change immediately follows a response and decreases the future frequency of that type of behavior in the similar conditions. The use of punishment is controversial because the word often elicits several negative connotations and misconceptions. There are two types of punishers. We'll be discussing positive and negative punishers. For negative punishers, I would like you to think of the removal, as this is when stimulus is removed in order to decrease a behavior's frequency. In regards, in regards to positive um, punishers, I would like you to think of addition, because this is when stimulus is added in order to decrease a behavior's frequency. An example of negative punisher is taking a student's cell phone for the remainder of class in hopes to decrease the student's off-task duration. An example of positive punishers would be assigning a student who forgets to turn in their homework assignment on time extra homework. This way, next time they, there's, it's time to turn in their homework, they will likely turn it in on time. As you can see, punishment is more like a consequence. There must be a consequence to problematic behaviors in order to hold the individual accountable to some degree. If we fail to do so, the individual has little to no chance of understanding why these problematic behaviors are unacceptable. Next, I would like to give a history of punishment. With all research, the use of punishment has come a long way in terms of treatment, training, and many other facets. It is essential to know that with all new methods, treatments, and interventions, we must conduct research to test the effectiveness of said practices. With that being said, I would like to play a couple of videos demonstrating how far we have come in the use of punishment. I'll show you, shows a type of restraint called the Utica crib. As you can see, it looks similar to a bed and the individual lays down while the top is then shut on top of them. It was said that they were left in here for, for extended period of time until they were calm as they were they engaged in self-interest behavior as well as endangering others in the facility. They even go on to state that sometimes they use curtains in order to black out any, any um, visuals from the outside um, of the crib. Most of the time these cribs were very uncomfortable and they kept them um, confined so that they could not hurt themselves. As you can see, it was very flat, and unlike the first bit, um, first picture, many of them were very close to their chest, preventing them from head banging or lifting their arms close enough to their face. The second video is a little bit newer, and it, um, in, in, it shows the use of electric shock as a punishment procedure. However, from um, observing the video, it doesn't show any instance where the boy is reinforced or um, suggesting a alternative approach. Uh, I'll play the video and let you guys see now. Screams of pain 
from a student at the Judge Rotenberg Center as he's tied down and shocked for hours. Good evening, I'm Mark Ockerman. I'm Maria Stefanos. Fox Undercover's camera, the only one in court today as a jury is given its first look at that disturbing video. Our investigative reporter, Mike Bodek, in that court today. He's here now to give us the latest. What do you have, Mike? Maria, this is the video that the Judge Rotenberg Center in Canton has fought long and hard to keep from the public eye. The center convinced the judge eight years ago to seal it. And the battle continued right up until it was played in court as lawyers for the center asked the judge to bar our camera from recording it. Well, the judge said no. And now for the first time ever, the public can see for itself what these controversial electric shocks look like in use. teenager Andre McCollins restrained face down, a helmet on his head, screaming for help. The Judge Rotenberg Center calls it treatment. As McCollins' attorney just described, the teenager was shocked 31 times in all that day in 2002. Collins is suing the Canton Bay Center, calling it torture. Lawyers for the center and its clinicians say McCollins needed aversive therapy because he was aggressive. These are dramatic There's no question about that. But the treatment period at the Rodenberg Center, the treatment period is under a in place on October 25. It was following. It was an emotional day for McCollins' mother, Cheryl, who was in court as video was played from the beginning of Andre's ordeal. When he was shocked and restrained after refusing to take off his coat. Please, 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 please. I never signed up for him to be tortured, terrorized, and abused. Next, I would like to give you a brief history of the use of punishment. In 1965, an article titled Screams, Slap, and Love examined how screaming, slaps, and love accompanied by shock treatment was used as a treatment procedure for four children with what was then known as a special form of schizophrenia called autism. The pictures to your right show a visual illustration of how these treatments were administered. As you can see, the little boy being reprimanded and yelled at also screamed at and even hit, struck in the face by a slap. <clears throat> Later that same year, another study, Building Social Behavior in Autistic Children by the Use of Electric Shock was also conducted. In this experiment, participants were two five-year-old twins diagnosed with childhood schizophrenia. They administered painful electric shock <clears throat> in their attempt to modify these children's behaviors. The results showed electric shock was effective in modding, modifying said behaviors. The behavior changes found were as follows. Learners approached adults to avoid electric shock. Self-stimulation and tantrums were eliminated. Affection and other social behaviors towards adults increased when they were associated with shock reduction. Four years later, in 1959, the use of pain and punishment as a treatment technique with childhood schizophrenics was also was then published. This experiment was also used shock, shock, electric shock, accompanied with slapping in order to gain insight on the effectiveness of pain and punishment as a treatment for um, children with schizophrenia. The following points provide evidence as to why this technique was effective. Punishment tends to alter behavior by suppressing responsiveness. When given on a contingent basis, the suppression is more specific, and punishment for incorrect responses facilitated learning the, of the correct response. Now, as we previously mentioned, we openly acknowledge the mistakes that we have made. Therefore, I would like to acknowledge some of the ethical violations that I believe these past research um, studies would have been violating. <clears throat> First, 
first is Ethics Code 2.05, Rights to Prerogatives of a Client. Clients and supervisees must be informed of their rights and about the procedures to log complaints about professional practices of behavior analysts with the employer and the appropriate authorities. In this instance, the mother from the electric shock video she did, stated that she did not sign up for her son to be degraded or harmed, and she had no idea that the electric shock was going to be part of this treatment. In ethics code 2.9 or 2.09, treatment intervention efficacy. Behavior analysts have the responsibility to advocate for the appropriate amount and level of severe service provision and oversight required to meet the defined behavior change program. The use of electric shot as a treatment prior to attempts of, at using reinforcement. The, the ex example, the video of electric shot being used in the computer room. In this instant, the child was in harm and there was a level of severity in which I believe they should have used reinforcement at first or at least given him a prompt versus immediately administering the electric shock based off of his non-response to remove his coat. Finally, Ethics Code 7.02, Behavior Analytic Assessments. If a client's legal rights are being violated, or if there is a potential for harm, behavior analysts must take the necessary actions to protect that client. This includes, and is not limited to, contacting relevant authorities, following organizational policies, and consulting with appropriate professionals and document, documenting their efforts to address this matter. The individuals who are slapped in this article entitled Slaps, Screams of Love may have consented. However, ethically speaking, this procedure is a clear example of harm to persons as well as a violation of their rights. In regards to the video of the boy getting electrically shocked, after that treatment, he was administered to a hospital and was suffering from trauma due to the electric shock. As previously mentioned, punishment has made advancements. This was necessary because of the excessive misuse and overuse of punishment found in the Sunland Training Center in Miami, thus leading to behavior analysts in the Code of Ethics. The investigation of resident abuse showed that very little research on the application of behavior principles were followed, forcing people to be beaten with a wooden paddle and excessive use of restraint. One resident was held in a restraint for 24 hours and restraints for use as punishment rather than an emergency method to protect the client from self-injury. My opponents will tell you that training has been provided to all personnel who enforce punishment procedures, such as physical or chemical restraint. While this should be true, unfortunately, some of these procedures are not being carried out ethically, in turn creating more of a problem behavior, negatively impacting the child, and not teaching the child the replacement behavior. Although Sunland Training Center was brought to light in 1972, in some cases, punishment has not or is still not being used correctly today, which can create frustration in the child and elicit escape or attention-seeking behaviors. In the video you are about to watch, Gino is a special education student at a school in California. During his time at school, he spent most of his day being restrained, to which he suffered injuries from. My opponent will tell you that trained personnel are the ones who execute restraint, so punishment is done properly. Sadly, Gino's case tells a very different story. It's not going to happen. 
happen again. It's not going to happen to the next generation. My future was taken from me. we can see that punishment resulted in aversive procedures was used excessively and was ineffective in helping Gino treat his behaviors. In fact, punishment denied him to the, the right to the least restrictive environment, treat, treatment, and the right to his education. Sadly, this is only one of many cases in which a student has been restrained excessively or injured from restraint. Although not all cases of punishment are as extreme as these, punishment must be used within the confines of the code of ethics to which a positive reinforcement is recommended and much more successful in treating behavior. In concordance with Ethics Code 4.08, considerations regarding punishment procedures, the following code states, 4.08a, behavior analysts recommend reinforcement rather than punishment whenever possible. 4.08c, before implementing punishment-based procedures, behavior analysts ensure that appropriate steps have been taken to implement reinforcement-based procedures. Code 4.06 recommends finding a strong reinforcer in a behavior change program. Lastly, Code 4.09 suggests that the least restrictive procedures are guaranteed to the client with positive reinforcement being able to be attained. Code 4.09 states, a restrictive procedure interferes with the client's inability to acquire positive reinforcement. Even though these codes are enforced by the BCBA, punishment procedures such as restraints and seclusion are still not being followed with fidelity. A 2013 study by the Autism National Committee found that only 13 states limit the use of restraint to emergencies. Only 20 states prohibit restraints that restrict breathing. Only 30 states require that parents be notified if their child was restrained or secluded at school. Again, not all punishment is of this severity, but teaching a replacement behavior can lead to more extreme behaviors, which can result in punishment procedures like these. While punishment decreases a behavior, positive reinforcement changes the behavior more significantly than punishment and is a recommended procedure. Punishment alone does not teach a replacement behavior, which we will discuss more at length later in our debate. In her journal publication, Using Reinforcements for Effective Discipline, Beth Ackerman states, It is always difficult to determine what types of rewards or punishments to use, but it is always important to start with the simplest, least restrictive. Doing so teaches the child to internalize the behavior rather than being motivated by fear of the teacher's severe punishment. There are several evidence-based punishments that can be used to become effective in behavior change with less of a threat of becoming aversive. Of course, if behavior change is not occurring or the procedures are visibly becoming too aversive, the usage should be stopped immediately and another appropriate method can be tried. This falls under the Ethical Code 2.09, Treatment Intervention Efficacy, which states behavior analysts have the responsibility to advocate for the appropriate amount and level of service provision and oversight required to meet the defined behavior change program goals. It is important to know that punishment procedures are not meant to be permanent. Data collection is taken by professionals, so analysis can be done to systematically fade out punishment once the behaviors have improved and can use reinforcement more. This follows the Ethical Code 2.11 on records and data, which states behavior analysts create, maintain, disseminate, store, retain, and dispose of records and data relating to their research practice and other work. There are a few rules to follow for punishment to be ethically used. One is that reinforcement must have been tried first and did not work or is used in the combination of reinforcement. Secondly, re physical restraints are often seen as a form of punishment but are only ethical and legal 
to use when the child is being physically dangerous to themselves or others. A behavioral assessment should be done to follow ethical code 3.01 on behavior analytic assessments, which states behavior analysts conduct current assessments prior to making recommendations or developing behavior change programs. Punishment is done right when the BCBA ensures all of or all who are carrying out such punishment strategies are properly trained in the methods as part of Ethical Code 5.0 Behavior Analysis as Supervisors. For example, there are special crisis management training such as safety care and physical and psychological management training. These trainings involve participants learning and practicing methods of de-escalation, self-defense, and physical restraints. Through these trainings, it is strongly encouraged to use restraint as a last resort when dealing with problem behaviors. Professionals must pass a test to become certified, and then each year there is a recertification that also goes along uh, with any new rules or procedures. There are several evidence-based punishment interventions that can be used by professionals within this field. The two I would like to make a point of are overcorrection and response costs, since these are least intrusive me methods. It shows that not all punishment interventions have to be intense or require physical management. The first is called overcorrection, where an application of a negative event or removal of a negative event is used to decrease the behavior and can be broken into two types, restitutional overcorrection and positive practice overcorrection. A study on a very low functioning woman uh, who disrobed frequently was done by Fox where both types of overcorrection were used. Restitutional overcorrection is when the client must return to the previous place the bad behavior had occurred in and make it better by overly practicing the desirable behavior. This typically is cleaning up after one's own behavior um, and then doing more. Restitutional correction, overcorrection was used in the single case study where the woman had to wear extra clothing and whenever the woman was discovered nude, she was reprimanded, asked to pick up her clothes and then put them back on um, in a changing room facility. Positive practice overcorrection is when the individual demonstrates undesirable behavior. He or she is expected to practice the correct behavior over and over again. Positive practice overcorrection occurred in the Fox study where the woman was directed to fix the appearance of other clients within the program such as helping to zip up or button um, jackets or tying shoots. The results of the Fox study shows, showed a decrease in frequency of the disrobing behaviors. You'll see on day five during the timeout procedures alone, um, as a baseline, the woman disrobed about 11 times. During the phases where both types of overcorrection were used simultaneously, the frequency was variant from two to zero, but by day 30, the study um, for the individual stops disrobing for the remainder of the study. The next intervention that I'd like to talk about is called response cost, which it can be defined as the loss of a specific amount of reinforcement contingent upon target behavior. The use of this type of punishment reduces the future probability of the target behavior. Some examples of this are loss of recess time, fines, the token system, um, and with the token system, previous training indicated that starting out with all tokens and trying to keep them compared to trying to earn them along the way to get access to a reinforcer was actually more effective. The study examining the effects of response costs as a treatment for escape linking behavior um, results there stated that with the addition of the response cost contingency, the negative reinforcer, which was actually escape, was in correspondence with the preferred stimulus of attention or music. Furthermore, this illustrated that 
when destructive behavior produced escape, it is also it also resulted in the loss of the preferred stimulus. Reinforcement procedures generalize well to other settings, behaviors, and staff or people implementing them, whereas punishment procedures don't. They generalize inappropriately as they can lead to extinguishing both appropriate and appropriate and inappropriate behaviors. For example, raising your hand in class is a behavior that is deemed to be very appropriate. Reprimanding students for asking questions without raising their hands can lead to students not asking questions in class at all, even when they are appropriately doing so. Here we see the effects of attending to um, of attending behavior. The on-task attending behavior was significantly higher when the behavior was being reinforced compared to when a punishment procedure was being used. Behaviors tend to show more significant change when reinforcement procedures are used compared to when punishment procedures are implemented. Although punishment has a negative connotation to it, there are actually several benefits of punishment. Punishment and reinforcement exist together to decrease and increase behavior. According to the Applied Behavior Analysis textbook, punishment is just as important as reinforcement. As stated before, punishment has positive consequences. Punishment exists in the natural environment and affects our everyday life. For example, punishment helps us as humans determine when a behavior is dangerous and helps us learn to avoid dangerous behaviors. If you touch a hot pan and get burned, you are less likely to handle a hot pan without a heat protecting glove. If you eat a plant in the wild that makes you sick, you are not likely to eat that plant again. Punishment actually helps increase our chances of survival. I have given examples of punishment as it relates to our everyday life. I think it is important to highlight the effects punishment has on other serious behaviors. One such behavior people with developmental disabilities involves People with developmental disabilities involve self-injury. Self-injury can range from hitting and biting oneself to headbanging and pulling out hair. Self-injurious behaviors can be life-threatening and cause permanent damage to the individual. Punishment has rapid effects on self-injurious behavior. Court, Wolf, and Locke compared three different procedures to determine the effectiveness at reducing self-injurious behavior. Differential reinforcement was only effective when food was withheld. However, punishment was consistent in reducing behavior. My opponents would have you believe that punishment is not an ethical practice, but please consider the benefits of appropriately administered punishment compared to the detriment self-injurious behavior can cause. The type of punishment administered depends on the behavior you want to decrease. When thinking about self-injurious behavior, non-aversive stimuli appears more ethical but actually has a higher chance of injury. A study was done on the punishment of self-injurious behavior using aromatic ammonia as the aversive stimuli. According to Azrin and Holtz, in order for punishment to be effective, it must be administered immediately following the unwanted behavior. The participant in this study was a 20-year-old woman with autism. She engaged in the self-injurious behavior of hitting and biting. She was also known to eat her own feces and urine if left unattended. The study used a reversal design to ensure the treatment caused the change in behavior. When the participant hit herself, a capsule of ammonia was placed under her nose and remained there until she stopped hitting herself. This graph shows the rate of the participant's behavior both during baseline and the intervention. Just by looking at the graph, you are able to see a drastic decrease in the self-injurious behavior. I think you would agree that the smell of ammonia for a few seconds is better for the participant than hitting herself over 60 times in a minute, as the highest baseline data point shows. The study I just discussed took place in 1975, so I'd like to further prove my point by discussing the use of punishment in the present day. I think it is important for anyone watching this debate to understand I'm not condoning punishment without a purpose or punishment meant to hurt, embarrass, or permanently harm a client. 
In present-day ABA, there are rules and regulations surrounding the use of punishment. For example, I am a member of the crisis team at my job and am required to attend yearly training conducted by a certified trainer. Ethical Code 4.08D discusses the need for behavior analysts to ensure proper training when using aversive procedures. The punishment procedure should also be reviewed regularly to ensure the intervention is at an appropriate and effective level. self signals for behavior is one is another concern for people on the spectrum as it can severely impact their ability to learn and can be socially significant. self signals for behavior one method of punishment that has been extremely effective when decreasing self-stimulatory behavior is response interruption redirection. A story, study was done called Response Interruption Redirection for Vocal Stereotypy in Children with Autism, a Systematic Replication. It looked at the effectiveness of response interruption and redirection on decreasing self-stimulatory behaviors. The participants were two boys with autism who engaged in vocal stereotypy. The study used a reversal design to ensure the intervention was effective. Participants were interrupted during vocal stereotypy and asked to follow simple directions. During baseline, both participants showed a high and variable level of the target behavior. During response interruption redirection, both participants showed an immediate and distinct decrease that remained relatively stable throughout the duration of the intervention. If you have ever seen a person engage in unusual self-stimulatory behavior, you understand how socially significant it can, be, it can appear. The graph in the study shows an immediate and effective decrease in the vocal stereotypy. The reversal design also demonstrates that the response interruption and redirection intervention most likely caused the change in behavior. Oops. ABA training focuses primarily on implementing reinforcement procedures based on our ethics code and the ethics codes previously discussed. Special requirements are required for implementing punishment procedures, and this can extend the time needed for approving a behavior plan, leaving the client without an intervention. Punishment procedures fail to teach functionally equivalent behaviors, making them short-term solutions to problem behaviors. This combined with the potential for harmful side effects makes the use of punishment less ideal than using reinforcement procedures. My opponents have said that it's ethical to use punishment when reinforcement procedures fail to produce significant behavior changes with our clients. However, there is a multitude of reinforcement schedules that should be tried before implementing punishment procedures. It is also important to establish reinforcers that are truly reinforcing the behaviors desired. Sometimes the problem can be that the reinforcers aren't actually reinforcing behaviors. Other times the issue can be that the reinforcement schedule is too thick or too thin. Crisis management procedures and punishment aren't necessarily the same thing. Trainings are conducted outside of ABA as they are not part of ABA procedures despite their usage in many ABA clinics and facilities. Crisis management procedures that use restraint are not always punishing. Some clients find it very reinforcing to receive that physical attention, increasing their problem behaviors to access that level of physical attention. Punishment procedures can lack proper training. Response cost, overcorrection, safety equipment, timeout, and RIRD procedures are generally taught to staff by the BCBA or in-house RBTs, and there is potential for treatment drift without diligent oversight, and this can also lead to misuse of these punishment procedures when that diligent oversight is not present. To sum up the pro side of this argument, punishment is an option when reinforcement is not working on correcting the unwanted behavior. Punishment is not as unethical as once, as it once was when the field of applied behavior analysis began. It has evidence-based interventions that when used correctly and is monitored by the BCA, it is ethically sound. Clients have the right to effective individualized interventions to promote behavior change, and it is our job practicing ABA to provide this. With this, extensive research should be done in order to find the best punishment procedure or a plan with, it, with the combination of reinforcement and punishment. Thorough 
training on procedures and protocols ensure the treatment of punishment is being carried out in a legal and ethical manner. Remember that punishment is not is I'm sorry. The, remember that punishment is only temporary, and we do not suggest prolonged use. If trained professionals collect data throughout the whole process, the punishment can be faded out after working over a period of time or stopped if it is not working or causing harm. Punishment is not always aversive and can be stopped if it becomes harmful or is changing or is not changing the undesirable behavior emitted by the client. It is important to conduct behavioral assessment and further research um, evidence-based punishment interventions. Every client responds to procedures differently. In reviewing and finalizing the con side of this debate, behavior analysts are held to maintain high standards and are provided with professional and ethical compliance codes to ensure this very matter. Referencing these codes, we can see the following areas of concern. As stated in Ethics Code 4.08, punishment is ethically allowed when reinforcement is used in conjunction with the punishment and when reinforcement alone has failed. Ethics Code 1.01 .01 says, behavior analysts rely on professionally derived knowledge based on science and behavior analysis when making scientific or professional judgments in human service provision or when engaging in scholarly or professional endeavors. For an issue that generates such heated controversy, we have very little empirical punishment research to guide us compared to the evidence base for reinforcement. Indirect side effects or negative side effects of punishment include collateral increases in aggression, escape behavior and emotional reactions, all of which can be very dangerous, both for the client and for the professionals trying to help them. Punishment overshadows reinforcement and behaviors that could be reinforced. As the individual is avoiding aversive consequences instead of seeking schedules of positive reinforcement. If punishment is too excessive, it can outweigh the effects of positive reinforcement as the individual seeks to avoid components altogether. In other words, if punishment is used in excess, it can cause the individual to seek escape which can overshadow and outweigh all the positive reinforcement strategies that have been taught or put in place for the individual. Finally, some scholars, Lavina and Donella, have argued that punishment is unnecessary, claiming that reinforcement-based strategies provide the efficacy of punishment without harmful side effects, thereby making punishment unethical. conclusion you can see the pros and cons both had excellent points in this debate as you can see the pros in green they would believe it decreases the behavior it can be used when it appears that reinforcement is not working and it can only be used ethically in conjunction with reinforcement procedure on the other hand the cons may argue that it does not teach a replacement behavior and that adverse adverse punishment can actually hinder a client Punishment could even elicit, elicit escape in the client to seek negative attention. As we move on, I open the floor to any questions you may have, and I thank you for all joining us, and have a great night. Thank you.